Hey there, JJ Meets World fan. This is your host with the most JJ. Today's episode of JJ Meets World features Star Wars and Star Trek. We're going to put our squabbling aside and just talk about the major impacts that these films and television shows and action figures have had on the entire world. Dr. Greg Carlson makes a reappearance and Tucker and I talk about fictional foods that we wouldn't mind trying all of this and so much more on today's episode of JJ meets world. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit JJ where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple podcast and give us a five star review. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. When I'm watching a movie or a television show and they present some kind of a fictional food, I always get a little hungry and I always think like, well, what's the closest equivalent that I could have for that? For example, when I was a little kid, my mom asked me what I wanted for my birthday dinner and she said, I'll make you anything. And I said, roast beast, because that was in (laughs) How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And it looked so delicious when the animated Grinch, I'm talking about the Chuck Jones. Yeah, one. And it looks so good when he was carving that thing up. And so I've had this love affair with fake food for, uh, for uh, forever. And I think of some of the series that that boast the best fake food, uh, Harry Potter. Um, Ooh, right. The Lord of the Rings. Some great let's not forget. Let's not forget Hook. Oh, yeah. The whole the whole <laughs> sequence from Hook where they're eating and having the food fight. Oh, <laughs> Whoa, 100 percent. The giant ribs that Fred Flintstone eats (laughs) from the Flintstones. Um, uh, Doozer sticks. Oh, my God. Watching Fraggle Rock. All I wanted was a doozer stick so much. I remember Uh, as a kid always thinking that turkey legs looked so much more appetizing in cartoons than they did in real life because it was basically just like a sphere of meat that didn't have any sinew or fat and it was just basically on a stick almost like a corn dog (laughs) like uh Mm -hmm. like the the bone and then i'd always be disappointed in the real thing i also loved the look of what are effectively called dagwood sandwiches where it's just a sandwich that's like a mile high and then the you'd, you'd the the cartoon would always be able to eat it in one bite i always thought that looked absolutely delicious so today we're in today's episode, we talk about Star Wars and Star Trek. It's not a which is better. We just kind of lay out both of them have had huge cultural impacts. And one of those pieces of cultural impact is the food that's a part of it. So in the recent Star Wars series, I wanted to taste what a roasted porg was like. Yeah. I mean, that <laughs> porg that Chewbacca makes looks so good. Um you know, it makes you wonder if the porgs who are watching him eat are actually also salivating and not being sad. Right. Maybe they're a cannibalistic species. We don't know. <laughs> um, and now Star Trek, oh, with their food replicator, you could get just about anything. But OK, so let's talk about uh, just quickly. Uh, is there something from Star Trek that you've always wanted to try, Tucker? I've always I've always wanted to try Romulan ale. Because Romulan ale is typically something that, get, that gets brought up as a uh, as a very difficult uh, alcohol to drink. It's usually, oftentimes, what happens is you know they've got, uh, say, on the Enterprise, they've got ten forward. So the bar is making uh, food and drinks for people, and all of the alcohol is made with synthahol, which is a synthetic alcohol that will give you all of the fun parts of getting drunk, but then those feelings can be taken away in an instant with like an injection where suddenly you're not drunk anymore. You have all your faculties. You don't get hung over. And then when people say, no, I want the real stuff, the bartender usually has behind the bar a jug of Romulan ale, which they have somehow smuggled on board. Um, Star Trek is also has always often been very quick to say that 
yes, replicator food tastes really good, but it it can't beat the real thing, which is why you've got uh, Captain Riker in Picard becoming a pizza chef because the 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 food made with actual organic materials typically tastes better. Um, do you remember in the Next Generation um, how um, Whoopi Goldberg? There's an episode where she's serving Klingon blood wine. I think so. Yeah. And uh, she's she's talking about this blood wine and Worf uh, grabs a glass of what he thinks is blood wine and drinks. He goes, ah, yes, the warriors drink. And she goes, well, we call it prune juice. (laughs) And it makes you think like, well, what are what are Klingons drinking in that thing? Um, yeah. Blue milk from Star Wars. Uh, mm. I think that's always been something that's been very popular. In fact, I think the, for the last Star Wars movie that came out, a couple major milk brands dyed their milk blue, uh-huh. which just I I can't get past that. I you know I'm a texture and a visual guy, and that would be that would be tough uh, for me to get past. But we break down a lot about these things. So here's the deal. If you're not a fan of Star Wars or you're not a fan of Star Trek or you're not a fan of either, you get a great cultural understanding of the importance of these things. And you may not think that they affect any part of your life, but they do. And here's something that we don't mention in the podcast that we should have, which is Star Trek was the basis for inventions in the 90s and early 2000s where fans of the original series had grown become engineers and they wanted to figure out a way there's a reason why flip phones look so much like communicators right if you look at next generation too, half the time they're essentially using precursors to ipads right so i I, even if you think you don't have anything to do with these you absolutely do uh dr greg carlson is our guest on this you've heard greg on many episodes of jj meets world and uh, i suggest you go back and listen to them in fact after this one uh, i really think that if you are intrigued by our conversation seek out our episode with richard edland who's one of the effects masterminds on things like ghostbusters and indiana jones plus star wars uh so there's some great stuff in fact if any of you watch the movies that made us on uh, netflix he's a frequent guest talking about the special effects work but we i like this episode because it's a great breakdown and it's kind of a nerdy conversation that i think is very very accessible to to whomever happens to be there uh it's also 100 percent family friendly um, right. And Star, Star Trek and Star Wars both sort of inhabit similar spaces in in the in the culture and they often get mentioned in the same breath. And so, um, you know, uh, all of us here are, are fans of both. But definitely I come from a much more uh, stronger Star Trek background. Greg obviously fell in love with movies because of Star Wars in the 1970s. Um, JJ is, I think, much more representative of the general populace when finding fandom of both. So we really sort of explore the pop culture space uh, where these two franchises fit in, where they converge, where they diverge. I I was really happy to have this conversation on a gorgeous Sunday morning with Greg. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into this episode of JJ Meets World with Greg Carlson, where we break down Star Wars and Star Trek. JJ Meets World. A debate older than uh, than I am. There are people who prefer Star Wars and there are people who prefer prefer Star Trek. And then in the middle, there are the people who like I like both of them. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about uh, you know, the cultural impacts made by these two franchises. We're going to talk about the financial impacts. Uh, we've got a little bit of everything going on, and uh, who better to join the conversation than Dr. Greg Carlson, a frequent guest on JJ Meets World, and uh, easily one of the best guys to talk about movies with. Hey, Greg. Hey, good morning. So uh, so let's start with this. Um, I think let's start with Star Trek, because that technically is older than Star Wars. So mm-hmm. yeah. age, age before beauty on this one. Um <laughs> Star Trek, the original series, uh, comes out and it hits that sci-fi itch that everyone seemed to have at the time, created by Gene Roddenberry. I will be honest, it is a chore for me to watch the original Star Trek series. I love the movies. Uh, I, I grew up watching The Next Generation, so I just skipped the original series 
and went straight on. So my nostalgia for the original series isn't quite as uh, as deep as some people. Yeah, I, I have an uncle who's been on the podcast before, uh, Paul McDonald. He's in the episode. I forget the number, but it, the title is called Uncle Baseball. One of my favorite episodes. Yeah. And he so when he was growing up, he was a sickly kid. Uh, his kidneys weren't functioning properly, so he had to stay indoors most of the time. So he would watch two things. He would watch baseball and he would watch Star Trek and uh, became a Trekkie that way. And so when I was a kid and I'd visit my grandparents' house, he always had this giant library of VHS tapes of the original series and of Star Trek The Next Generation. And so I would just pour through those things. And I I hear you, JJ, as far as, uh, you know, the the older production values, the older style, um, it it doesn't uh, quite match up when you're used to a a sort of a sci-fi cinema language from the 80s and 90s, like we both are. Um, But, uh, you know, I think if you are someone who can get into more of that sort of vintage TV, Nick at Night, um, you know, I dream of genie bewitched era of TV going up. Uh, Batman would be another one. Um, Star Trek uh, shares a lot of the uh, similarities in the aesthetic when it comes to it. And it was also a very forward thinking, you know, progressive show for its time. So I, I don't know, Greg, where you stand with, you know, do we get Star Wars if we don't have Star Trek or not? But Star Trek does seem to kind of be the thing that really kicked off um, interplanetary travel as a uh, as a fictional bedrock in in American television at the very least. I think the show looks great. I think it still looks great. I like the sound design of the original series. It's uh, it's it, to me it's comforting, um, even if it looks you know less expensive than star wars later but star wars had you know was relatively speaking a low budget um enterprise when when george lucas you know scraped up the funds or begged for the funds from from lad you know in the board uh to you know to raise the budget from you know nine million to 11 and you know whatever they ended up coming coming in at you know they were cutting a lot of corners too so um I think, you know, I think, yeah, Star Trek, my, my, my memories of, of seeing it were the, the sound, the sound design, especially, um, the sound of the phasers and the sound of the doors opening and the sort of, um, heartbeat of the ship itself. And so I had, you know, um, the Mego, uh, enterprise playset, the vinyl, uh, you you could open the the vinyl playset and you'd have the bridge and you'd have the the uh, transporter. You'd put a figure inside and you'd push the button and it would spin spin around. So um, I had that in conjunction with my interest in in Star Wars. So I'm not sure which one I saw first because I was five years old when Star Wars came out. I mean, Star Wars was for you was just a singular moment in your yeah. life, in your life, you know, where when you saw that it sort of changed the tides for you. Yeah. Um, when I first got introduced to Star Trek, you know, from my uncle was the time that Next Generation was on TV mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And so when I think in terms of Star Trek, where I where my heart really lies, it's really with that cast. It's with Star Trek, the next generation with Jean-Luc Picard and Riker yeah. and Deanna Troy and Data. Um, great characters, uh, great, great characters. But that, that, that notion of, uh, it, it was sort of, a it was a, a perfect setup for doing, a, a monster of the week type story format, because basically space is your canvas and you have a ship that can take you absolutely anywhere. And in the, in the infinite amount of possibilities in space gives you sort of infinite options for storytelling. And so from episode to episode, either in the original series or in the next generation, um, you're getting uh, a, a new, almost like a, like a fable, like a morality tale of some kind where they're going to examine some sort of modern day, our modern day, uh, problem and they'll use science fiction as sort of the tool to parse it to 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 deal with it and uh 
I think it was it's really interesting how Star Trek is sort of sort of the vanguard when it comes to pushing some of those boundaries at the time. If you think about Star Trek, the original series, um, that's credited with having, uh, I believe, the first interracial kiss that was ever right. seen on television um, between uh, Kirk and Uhura. Um, and uh, yeah, and then also, I also think of, when I think of the original series, I think of the, the primary color palette, which is a very Star Trek uh, style. Mm-hmm. You had uh, red, blue, and uh, yellow or really gold for the commanding class in the original Star Trek, um, which is where we get the term red shirts, which were always the the yeah. the sort of the uh, the the meat for the grinder whenever they'd <laughs> go fodder. <laughs> yeah, whenever they'd go down to a, a planet, right? Uh, and some of them are likely not to return. You pretty much know <laughs> who that's going to be before they leave. You know, one Changing, of the, the things ahead. I think about with Star Trek is. They took a very bold stance uh, to make this a, a Navy like experience. So the the idea of Star Trek is it is like a space Navy and being barely two decades out of World War Two. I think that they kind of captured a, a lot of feelings that people had this idea of. Uh, you know, gosh, you know, there's the the first lieutenant uh, to take the bridge. You've got your helmsman. It played to people in that era in a way that I don't know it necessarily would today. Um, and also, it it is amazing to me to think the original series was only three seasons. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, you take a modern series today. Like, could you imagine um, Parks and Rec? having the cultural impact it did after only three seasons on the air and then being canceled. Uh, I, I find that to be just um, amazing. Um, and then Star Trek immediately spilled into just everything. So you had Saturday Night Live doing Star Trek sketches. Uh, you had uh, the Star Trek fandom as a, as as a piece that just builds and builds and builds. You had it as ref in references of, in other television shows and other types of media, and so it immediately captured the imagination of people. But like I said, it was only on for three seasons, starting in 1966, and then we don't even get the first Star Trek film until '79. So right. to me, and that's. Pr- and that's probably due largely to the success of Star Wars. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. So this movie, you know, Star Trek kind of owes a piece of itself to Star Wars and Star Wars owes a piece of itself to Star Trek. Right. And so kind of, the, you know, with this episode, you know, we're really focusing on why these two things get compared. And on a surface level, you could say, well, yeah, they both have star in the title. Um but uh, they, I can't. Ima- I, I don't think there's another sci-fi franchise of this type in American pop culture um, that has the same elevation that Star Trek and Star Wars have. The same devoted fan base, and they often get mentioned in the same breath because they are these sort of space operas. These uh, that that deal with uh, futurism, that deal with speculative fiction. Um, even though, uh, you know, Star Trek is very much our future here on Earth versus Star Wars, which is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But it still represents us in a lot of ways. So I guess, Greg, my, my first question to you would be, why is it you think primarily Star Trek and Star Wars often get mentioned in the same breath? Oh, gosh, I, I, I imagine it's the the longevity of the of the you know franchises that they both have um, roots in, like JJ mentioned, more than one uh, aspect of the media. So there's, you know, television, film, and then the the breadth of uh, ancillary product, novels, games, toys, you know, merchandising, all that that kind of stuff. And in that regard, they are mutually um, beneficial to one another. Like, you know, JJ said, part of Star Trek is assisted and and uh, fostered by the popularity of Star Wars and vice versa. Um, I I th- I think to kind of go back to one of the things you just said, Tucker. Star Trek is more um, interested in kind of 
the traditional aspects of science fiction, um, political and social ideas that can be explored really effectively in that episodic format on TV. And Star Wars is so much steeped in the kind of um, operatic myth-making of you know, the Joseph Campbell here with a thousand faces kind of stuff that we've, you know, anyone who talks about Star Wars talks about, you know, Lucas's interest in the, in the monomyth and figuring out, you know, how to apply some of these things from um, literature to create not so much science fiction, but science fantasy or, you know, space fantasy. I've been watching tons and tons of Westerns lately. And, uh, you know, Star Wars is as much a Western um and a samurai film as it is you know uh a science fiction movie to me yeah it's, i think it follows a lot of those same beats uh you know you've got the old gunslinger and you've got uh, i i th- even some of the wordage if i'm not mistaken greg you know the word jedi uh comes from the old samurai legends um yeah some of that language i mean certainly originates with um Lucas's interest in Kurosawa films. And we know that he wanted to consider at least um, the possibility of casting Toshiro Mifune um, as Obi-Wan Kenobi um, at one point, which would have been, you know, obviously a much different movie had that, had that taken place. Um, But yeah, I, I, um, that's, that's sort of a, a, a dividing line for me between Trek and Wars is the, um, not just the, origins in you know one is in television and and one is in the theatrical feature but also kind of the genre um it's not to say that star trek didn't also take an interest in exploring other genres um in you know in the small screen space but star wars is um is pretty remarkable in the way that it blends you know it's such a um a mashup have you have either of you guys seen any of Kirby Ferguson's videos. Um, he's the guy who does everything as a remix. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got two episodes devoted to Star Wars, and they really do a good job of um, bringing into sharp focus in a really succinct and kind of simple way the, the nature of um, Lucas's uh, basically remixing the things that he loved from Flash Gordon you know, to um, World War II combat films for the dogfights and everything in between. Even in the titles of these two things, I know I'm kind of sticking on the titles a little bit too much, but there's even just a hint at sort of their overall arc, um, whereas Star Wars has much more to do with good versus evil, um, you know, a, a struggle, a struggle for uh, yeah. our hearts and souls. And Star Trek is so much more focused on exploration on ideas, on seeing what's out there, about learning something new. And uh, so, you know, JJ, you had kind of said, um, you know, Star Wars versus Star Trek is often the debate that uh, our fellow nerds have in our fellow nerdy communities. And I've certainly engaged in that debate before. But at my heart, I have to go, you know, I'm a, I'm a man of different seasons. Some days I'm feeling kind of Star trek some days I'm feeling kind of Star Warsy, right? And uh, uh, I, th- I think too that might be one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of The Mandalorian right now is getting Star Wars, but in a serialized, episodic, not in the movie terms, but in in sort of a television term. Um, there was an overarching storyline, but then there were subplots that got explored in every single episode and you got to explore different genres in every different episode, which was something that Star Trek did very well, especially in next generation. When you have things like the holodeck and you're, you're meeting new races and you're exploring the galaxy even further. Um, Let's, let's go like this. Let's examine uh, each, uh, each of these individually. And then we can kind of have the mashup in between, like for example, Um, we all hate the political parts of both Star Wars and Star Trek. It's the most boring part of any of these uh, features. So uh, we. But can I would agree say on something. I would say though that the the political dimensions. I mean, yes, the rendering on screen. I'm I'm as you know, I'm no fan of the prequels, 
Um, I'm because of my age as a Gen Xer, I was an originalist who got to see the, you know, all the the films of the first the classic trilogy theatrically. So I was grown up in 1999 and was kind of taken aback um, and thought, oh, you know, this is all of this political intrigue is not the Star Wars that I grew up with. And yet, as I'll, I, I'm going to surprise everybody by by defending George Lucas a little bit in that the longer Star Wars has existed and the richer it expands, there's a kind of um, fascinating quality to the the nuances of there is no right or wrong. Initially, it was very black and white. I mean, Darth Vader was dressed in black and Princess Leia was dressed in white. It couldn't have gotten any more kind of classic Western than that. But um, I like the ideas that have been explored in later media, like Rogue One, that the Jedi are not great. Um, and in, in the, you know, and in the Clone Wars, that the Jedi are messed up and that they're just as bad in their own way and short sighted as what would become the Empire. And I like that aspect of the politics, even though I hear what you're saying, JJ, that the sort of the rendering of the scenes in the Senate and there's so much interest in the kind of evolution of Palpatine's schematic um, in the in the prequels that it doesn't really line up with as much from the classic trilogy. Yeah, and I mean, you don't what, get nearly as much Jimmy Smiths as you would really want. <laughs> right. No, I, I'm with you on that. Um, you know, I, from a Star Trek perspective, one of the common criticisms of Star Trek, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a good criticism. It makes sense, um, is, you know, endless scenes of meetings around tables where, <laughs> you know, Romulans and Terrans and Klingons and Ferengi <laughs> yeah. and, 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 uh, other Cardassians and other, other races are talking about, trade routes and taxation and blockades and stuff like that. However, as a Trekkie, um, and this is, again, mostly with Next Generation, something about the aesthetic of that show, the characters in that show, wanting to be on that enterprise, probably because I grew up with it. But I kind of live for the scenes in the um, the ready room or at the conference table when when Picard is asking for options from his crew and they're sort of talking about potential fixes to a problem um, because that's what that's effectively doing, especially with, you know, the ambassadors and representatives from different organizations and nations is they're doing world building. And one of the things that makes Star Trek so potent to its devoted fan base is the, the world is so well rendered and so well realized um, that you can really get, the sort of mental trick that you that 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 is a real place that is a real thing happening somewhere else you know hardcore star trek fans understand the reason why the the federation has the prime directive about first contact because last time they contacted a civilization without uh finding out if they were ready for them that was the klingons and that started a huge war right and and those sort of political things change the the status quo from time to time and and make the world itself, a living, breathing organism. But I fully understand how uh, how that can be sort of an, an anathema to, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, having a, a story in a movie that's going to move forward, that's going to, that's actually going to go somewhere. If it's just endless meetings around tables talking about the differences between Romulans and Vulcans, for most people, that's going to be a snoozer for sure. So, I mean, when I look at just the amount of work in this, so like, let's st we'll start with Star Trek. We, we were already on that level. So Star Trek has had 13 feature films and uh, oh my gosh, look at this five, six, seven. It's at this point, it's had seven television series Ooh. as well. If you don't count the animated series, they just announced the eighth, the eighth one too. A yeah, brand, brand lower, new one. Lower Decks is a new animated series that's coming up, and then the Untitled uh, series that we're going to be, or Strange New Worlds in Strange 2021. New Worlds, yeah. yeah. So, without a doubt, there's there's m more hours of Star Trek than there are of Star Wars. It, it's got to be almost ten to one at this point. 
when you think about Probably, how yeah. long some of those series ran. You know, Next Generations ran um, twice seven seasons, long. I believe. Yeah, twice more than twice as long than the original series did. You've got Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, which is airing at the time of this recording. Um, to to me, you know, this thing was just a it's a juggernaut. It uh, it just won't stop. And there's always the question when they're making a new Star Trek movie. Do we want another Star Trek movie? <laughs> and that is not something that they've ever really uh, put forward with Star Wars. I think that they, you know, every time a new Star Wars movie comes out, there's a, a a build, a new generation gets introduced to it. But to me, in my interpretation, is Star Trek is something where they are still, uh, they're still giving to the fans who watched the original motion picture. They're still giving to the fans who were fans when it originally aired, um, and. It's interesting because I don't see a lot of new Star Trek fans jumping on board with the exception of at one point, Star Trek fandom kind of took over a little bit of the hipster crowd. And so you saw people with, you know, a Spock T-shirt on or they had, a you know, they had socks with tribbles on them and it spilled out of what you would consider nerd culture, which at this point is just culture. And right. started to uh, started to take over these these other little pieces. Um, I myself am a huge fan of the Kelvin timeline. Uh, I thought what they did with quote unquote rebooting Star Wars with the Star Trek from 2009 was nothing short of genius because it allowed brand new fans to come in and start start watching star trek without having to really know anything about the previous star trek uh while at the same time having these wonderful winks and nods uh without saying well we're just going to recast everybody and sorry it's just it's going to look like this um and i've enjoyed all three films in the kelvin timeline it's 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 been my jam especially when you look at like insurrection and nemesis as the two films before Oof. that which to me were harder to watch Star Trek movies. <laughs> I agree. So, so on that note, JJ, I recently just rewatched in order all of the Star Trek The Next Generation films. And uh, as much as I absolutely love and swear by Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, Captain Picard is my captain and will always be, um, those movies suck <laughs> really really badly and it hurts me because when i watch them i go you know it's almost like they took the wrong lessons from star wars it's almost like they're going well yes it's star trek it's the next generation cast we love all these characters and these actors but let's then put them constantly in a life or death good versus evil struggle let's turn captain picard into an action hero um let's uh let's sort of not bring with it the DNA of the show and what it is about the show that actually made the show, I think, successful. Part of it being its introspective nature, its philosophical nature, um, its ability to explore, like it says in the in the opening credits, strange new worlds um, to seek out new life forms and new civilizations. And we don't really get that in the movies. And Greg, I you know, I, I don't know how you feel about uh, how you could even explore those themes in the movies, but uh, I I know at one point you had not yet seen all of the Star Trek films. Where are you with your Star Trek film palette right now? Um, well, I, I had made kind of a deliberate decision as a younger person um, to avoid the Star Trek theatrical films. Um, and it's a, it's a, I, I'm, I guess I'm only, I mean, maybe I'm only mildly embarrassed to admit that as a cinephile. But I saw the original motion picture on television um, when it, at my grandparents' house, and I have virtually no memory of it except the um, that there was an action figure of the bald woman. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. that. Um, but I, after at that point, I, I thought, no, this this isn't for me. You know, I'm I'm, I'm it was sort of as a religion. Um, I I had chosen 
a different path, you know? And so I didn't <laughs> you were, go you were, to... You went Protestant, you weren't Catholic, you were Protestant. Right, I, I had gone, I didn't go to any Star Trek movies theatrically, and I'd catch bits and pieces of them on TV. And that, uh, that was true for the entire um, span of their, of their, um, re- of the releases until the J.J. Abrams um, Star Trek. And I did, I did go see that, those in the, you know, in the theater. Um, and I wasn't thrilled, I guess. Um, initially I, I, I was okay. I mean, it was, it was okay. Um, but I completely echo your comments about, you know, what translates to the big screen versus what works on this more intimate space of the small screen. And, you know, television historically was for so long was as you know, people like Herbert Zettel would say it's a it's a close up, it's an intimate medium, it's a close up medium, and the the theatrical feature is a wide shot medium. You know, you so one lends itself to visual dynamic storytelling, like silent films were, where you can you know drink in the action without the need for dialogue, and then the other one is is sort of like close ups of people talking to each other, and so that for me explains part of your you know your uh, criticism of the the problems with the next generation films is that the you know they should they should have figured out a way i think you can do both you know that you can have mm-hmm. a smart movie with good ideas uh that still has visual dynamics in it but um yeah to render star trek as a simple matter of of black and white ethics doesn't doesn't do it any favors on the big screen I think you both are hitting on something that's really important here, which is the fact that Star Trek was born as a television show and they continually stumble when they go to these big screen feature films because they want to bring. First of all, the studios want to save money every time, which is why I think, Tucker, to your point, the next generation films are tough to watch because they said, well, we're just going to take the entire TV crew. We'll take the producers. We'll take the showrunners. And we'll just let them make a movie, but they have to use the sets that we already have. They have to use the same effects crew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. We're going to use most of our budget on having Patrick Stewart in this movie, basically. Right. And it, and it hurts and it shows in all of those Star Trek movies. And so Star Trek has always had a harder time in the film universe versus their television universe where their roots are. The same goes for Star Wars until recently. I know we know Tucker loves the Mandalorian. But every time Star Wars tried to step into the television medium, they I mean, lest we forget the Star Wars holiday special is one of the most (laughs) cringeworthy things that's ever been created. And then when you look at the the animated series that they put out, the Donnie and Marie special that they did, it it just (laughs) they just didn't know how to take this gigantic special effects heavy space epic and make it something that people want to watch on television and um lu- luckily star wars has realized you know what part of the problem is is that we're taking all of our uh movie knowledge and movie making skills and trying to shove them onto tv maybe we should u- just open this up to people who have an eye for that and um and so yes the mandalorian i think is absolutely fantastic uh, so much so i can't wait for the obi-wan series that's coming out but I also am uh, I would gladly triple the amount of money I pay for my CBS all access to continue watching Picard. I am way into it. So so one thing about, you know, mentioning the Mandalorian, um, but but I think it it touches on something really important about where Star Wars fits into the history of filmmaking is Star Wars as a franchise is one of those franchises that has almost always been at the forefront of technical innovation. Uh, in filmmaking, um, the visuals that they created in the original trilogy, um, you know, still using techniques that some had already been developed, but basically being perfected. Um, <clears throat> you know, spaceships never looked so good as they did in Star Wars: The Original Trilogy. Um, Star destroyers looked real; they look they look like giant frigates in space. Versus Star Trek, still had a, a fairly cheesy quality to how their ships were rendered. Um, even though the prequels get a lot of derision, um, 
you know, Lucas was pushing forward digital filmmaking at that time. We weren't really seeing full movies shot on green screen yet um, to, you know, vary, varying effects. You know, it, it wasn't quite perfected yet. But now with The Mandalorian, um, new cutting edge technology was brought into that as well. And they were able to make a, a serialized TV show look like it had a uh, cinematic production quality because they so they largely left green screen and blue screen in the background for effectively greg is basically like a uh it's like a, a screen projection on steroids right yeah yeah that that there have been a few articles that have attempted to explain the technology of of the extremely high definition um you know backgrounds that allow um, synchronization with camera movement so that the backgrounds move um, and the parallax of the whatever lens they're using stays uh, to our eye. It it keeps the the image correct. Uh, that's you know still mind blowing um, to me that that was so effectively because it is part you know in in a sense kind of the background. Um, it's it's a piece that if if you were it's it's sort of like why the puppet Yoda child, baby Yoda um, works so well, like Her Herzog said, you know, don't be a coward, right? You got to use the puppet. <laughs> like why, why would you shoot a CG version for safety? You know, don't even give them the option. And so I, I you know, the, however apocryphal or fanciful the um, embellishments of that story are, you know, whether they were ever really considering CG versus uh versus the puppet performance, which is so good. I mean, it's just it's Fantastic. it's really to to my eye, the uh, the child is like the best on screen sci fi puppet performance since the original Yoda. I would agree with that. Um, it it it's amazing what you know the difference between having a physical object and a CG object was one of the primary criticisms of comparing the original star Trek, or I'm sorry star wars trilogy to the prequel tr trilogy um, right i think of the uh i think it's a cg pear that anakin eats when he's uh sitting there with padme oh, or maybe so Pad 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 padme eats it and uh you you can just just the physics are wrong it's just there's something about it that fully pulls you out of it and and that's in a genre where the audience is already suspending their disbelief because we're talking about space wizards with laser swords and giant Wookiees and star destroying planets. Um, so the, the, the return to that, the basically it seems like the Mandalorian is a series that has the benefit of looking at the history of star Wars production and going, what keeps us in the story and what takes us out of it. And that Yoda puppet is not, it's artfully it's, brilliantly crafted it's brilliantly performed um it, you know the fact that he has no dialogue he just makes little coups you know sounds from time to time um and that it deepens the mystery of of yoda and yoda's species right well and that since you brought up the m word i think it's it's important to bring that up in a conversation about star trek and star wars um you know mystery and you know, J.J. Abrams famously, who's obviously worked with both franchises, gave his TED talk about the mystery box and has often spoken about the importance of of that in his own storytelling beyond um, the the science fiction stuff he's done. And I think that, you know, for many fans, the less mystery you have, the it decreases your interest. And so, you know, a lot is being made of Tamura Morrison coming back as Boba Fett in season two of the Mandalorian. And there are already these hand wringing kind of, you know, articles from a lot of the, the big, the big outlets saying like, Oh, he's going to, you know, there's this fear that Boba Fett is going to overshadow the, the Mandalorian title character. And I, and I, I find that if you can preserve the mystery I'm I'm more engaged with the with the content, and so the less we know about, um, we, we want to you want to have just the right amount, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, of the of the little treats 
related to Yoda's species and things like that. I mean, the fact that Yoda's species has never been named as an official element of of Leland Chi's holocron, you know, in the Star Wars pantheon, that is a great thing. And as soon as you name Yoda's species, then you reduce the mystery and I'm less interested. It was kind of like when I saw Yaddle um, mm. in the in the prequels. At that time, I it 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 wasn't I wish that it it had been done the way that Filoni and Favreau had imagined the child 20 years later. Um because I thought, oh there's there's another member of Yoda's species. I thought Yoda was maybe the last of his kind, or maybe not, but that there was a, a female one was was sort of um it, it was it was intriguing, but there's no there was no characterization to Yaddle in the way that there's so much character built into the elegance, uh the simple elegance of that of the puppet of the child. Uh I, I do have to say though, I have loved the onslaught of memes we've gotten on on the internet of uh, people speculating that baby Yoda would be Yoda and Yaddle's <laughs> love child who who could not be claimed because the Jedi are not allowed to fall in love <laughs> or or have sexual relations with each other apparently um and that 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 would then explain why Yaddle is suddenly no longer on the Jedi council when it comes to attack of the clones you know their their uh, order 66 had not been invoked yet they 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 were not purging Jedi yet but Yaddle leaves the council for some reason and <laughs> Maybe it's because she had, you know, who knows? I don't know if their species maybe just has a long gestation period. Like if it takes a while for the baby to form. But I, I have enjoyed those memes as we've got them. Um, JJ, I have a question for you kind of going back a little bit. Um, you were talking about the JJ Abrams Kelvin timeline and how uh, for you as a as a cinephile that really spoke to you. So as long I'm I'm talking to, you know, Greg Carlson and JJ Gordon, the people with the two largest voracious appetites i know when it comes to film and uh television series uh the i i have not seen as many films as either one of you let alone the two of you combined so i'm really interested in in jj where you're coming from from this before the kelvin timeline for you as a viewer did you kind of feel that star trek was as essentially inaccessible to you because of the amount of content that was out there did it kind of feel to you like you know star trek is a really daunting task because there's so much to know about I, i'm afraid i'm going to be missing out on stuff and was the kelvin timeline kind of a, a way that fixed that for you so <clears throat> for me this is the way it goes uh, I as a kid, I definitely didn't watch the Star Trek movies in order. I caught them on TNT whenever they were airing. And uh, I, you know, it. I was easily into my mid teens before I even saw the first Star Trek, the motion picture. And so to to me, my Star Trek fandom begins and ends with I love and I mean, I love I could watch it five times in a row if you told me to. Star Trek for the voyage home. Yes, I'm with um, you. And it it's interesting to me because that is that is the non ultra Trekky consistent favorite. If you ask people who are not, you know, I don't own a single piece of Star Trek clothing. I don't own a single piece of Star Trek uh, uh, toys or, uh, you know, I don't have some lead co covered glass that was given out by Burger King. Um, <laughs> but. I do. I love these storylines and mostly I love the characters, you know, like DeForest Kelly. I loved all of these people so much and watching Star Trek, the voyage home really, you know, spoke to me. And so I continue watching those. I remember Generations was the first Star Trek movie I saw in the theaters. And then I saw First Contact and then I saw Insurrection. And when I saw Nemesis, which came out the year I graduated from high school, I decided I was done with Star Trek. I thought, I, you know I, what? This just, you know, th th they're not even coming up with what I would consider compelling storylines at this point. And the actors who were in these series had either gone on to do different things or kind of felt like what I thought 
<laughs> the undiscovered country original cast felt to me you're getting too old to do some of this so you're trying <laughs> to force these other characters down my throat to be star trek junior you know like right. gosh as people are getting older and like to me that's uh, and i never got into uh, enterprise or voyager or deep space nine i certainly watched plenty of it but i do not know the ins and outs of that as well as i do for star trek the next generation the, so the star trek films uh, the star trek films themselves are also kind of a victim of the their own success of star trek II: the wrath of khan because every time a new star trek movie would come out if you look at like the old publications on it the old reviews and interviews um oftentimes the filmmakers would say you know we have a new villain that is going to rival that of Khan from number mm-hmm. two. And, and it, it never reaches that. We certainly heard that a lot with Nemesis, with Tom Hardy playing a, a young clone of Jean-Luc Picard. Of course, this was Tom Hardy before he was Tom Hardy, so they got him at a screaming discount deal, uh, which is what they needed to make those movies. Um, Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 of the original series is really, it's, it's almost one giant movie because uh, each film picks up ex- from the moment the previous film leaves off. Um, you know, you've got Star Trek 2, Wrath of Khan, 3 is uh, Search for Spock, and 4 is The Voyage Home. And so to me, that sort of three, that's, that, that's sort of my Star Trek trilogy. When I think of the Star Trek films, that's sort of the standard bearer that I look at. And all of the films that have come from there are always sort of aiming for the feeling that Wrath of Khan got. Even in the Kelvin timeline, I kind of wished that they hadn't just gone back and brought Khan back again for Star Trek, what is it, Into Darkness? Mm-hmm. Is that the, yeah. Um, and that they would have gone off in a, in a different direction. There's always the, 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 the need for a killer antagonist is something that the Star Trek films in general have always lacked at. And that's something that Star Wars has always excelled at. I mean, you can't get any better than Darth Vader when it comes to a a movie baddie, in my opinion. Well, and, and that is part of the issue with the Star Trek films is that they are written in some cases like a long television episode. And at the end of the episode, you need to wrap it up before the credits. Whereas mm-hmm. Star, Star Wars, every single one of those leaves you waiting for what you know gosh han solo's frozen in carbonite luke lost his hand and oh what, what are we gonna do i can't wait for the next one yeah. um trek trek always ends with that like you know i really learned something today moment yeah like i guess <laughs> i'll do this for another year um, i guess we really are more alike than we we've known before so when the reboot comes out for the kelvin timeline it felt to me like it was i dare you to come see this you know <laughs> and I thought, what the heck are they going to do? I mean, all they're going to do is just re- reboot the cast. But and now here's what I've found with people. I think people either like time travel or they don't like time travel. And if, <laughs> wherever you sit on that is going to be whether you liked Endgame or whether you were like, I've got some problems with it. Uh... Um, so given that idea, I I really enjoyed the fact that um They, you know, that they said, listen, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're just, you know, essentially we're going back to 1966 and you, and you know, you're watching it from the ground up. I love the fact that this, you know, they decide instead of this Kirk being the, the, you know, the ultimate uh, cadet, he is a problem child based on the fact of what happened to his dad and being raised by his stepfather. And I, I really got into that. And then leading into the second film with Into Darkness, I agree with you, Tucker. I think it was too tempting for them to say, like, well, technically it's the same universe or, you know, it's it's the, the universe is the same. So, you know, Khan would be there at some point. I think one of the most telling points of this movie uh, is when new Spock calls old Spock and mm-hmm. says like, you know, I, I promised I would never tell you anything about your future because I want your destiny to be your own. I'm like, are they talking about the movies right here? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then Spock, you know, g- giving him that advice on that Khan is one of the most ruthless people, uh, you know, ever. And, you know, his interaction with him came at great cost. Um, I think you needed a way to establish that. I liked Star Trek Beyond. I thought it was fun with the exception of whatever the voice coder that they gave to Idris Elba. 
Um, I think they could have just, le- you know, this is another thing, right? Both of these involve alien species and part, you know, you live or die by some of the makeup effects in these in these movies and in the television right. shows. And if you give someone a facial piece that impedes their ability to speak, you better have some amazing ADR afterwards right. because if they're trying to talk through <laughs> teeth, um, which is one of the problems I think I see with Klingons all the time. Like, I love that they eventually evolved the Klingon makeup to make it so that, like, you could emote a little more through it right um Klingons are essentially leather daddies pretty much right. they, <laughs> like they I put them what, in biker leather and they give them weird foreheads and weird teeth and they're like ah we'll just we'll do a little bit of whatever we want um i think one of the best is christopher Plummer as chang mm-hmm. um in uh which one was that that's uh undiscovered, undiscovered country, country star trek six you know they did other than adding those little wisp of a mustache they really let him have the ability to speak clearly. Um, the Klingons are a really good example of how, because Star Trek is so vast and so wide spanning and it's been made since the sixties, there are always going to be inconsistencies in timelines, in how creatures are presented, how makeup is developed. So between the original series and Star Trek The Next Generation, the Klingons had a complete revamped look. And the Star Trek fan base for for wanting to feel like this is all part of the same world there. I think there's a, a very convoluted explanation as to why the Klingons we encounter in the original series don't have the wrinkly foreheads because they're like a certain breed of Klingon or something like that. There's a lot of that sort of uh, gymnastics that has to happen, body contortion that has to happen to try to make everything sync up and the more star wars goes forward they're probably going to see issues like that as well um i wanted to go back really quick when you were talking about time travel jj greg i I believe time travel is something that has never been addressed in star wars media ever right and that might be one of the things that highlights the differences between these two in that star wars doesn't really seem that concerned with speculative fiction about future and the nature of reality as much as it is about the monomyth right have we ever seen anything like time travel in star wars well the close i mean i i'm there's undoubtedly been conversations about introducing time travel into the main into the into the primary theatrical features i can't speak for the ancillary media because i don't i'm not a fan who reads the novels and and all the comic books i did read the original marvel series um but I think that the what they do instead of time travel is a kind of um, parallel to time travel, and that is the perpetual resurrection of characters. So death, in a sense, you know, ta- as death and time are intertwined, right? Obi Wan is struck down, but he is warned Darth Vader that he'll become more powerful than he could possibly imagine, and then within a few minutes we actually hear the disembodied voice of Obi-Wan telling Luke, you know, how to defeat the Death Star. And so that sets this precedent where by the time we get to Rise of Skywalker, everybody gets resurrected. Uh, Everybody. Uh, It seems like all the major characters um, and many of the minor characters are either um, it's it's hinted that they've that they've died and they haven't like Chewbacca, you know, spoiler alert, um, or in the case of Kylo Ren being force healed. Um, but, you know, you go through the, the primary cast and it seems like, you know, Luke, Leia, Han, uh, all resurrected, Palpatine resurrected, Snoke even resurrected, C-3PO resurrected. R2D2 resurrected. Mm. You know, mm. I, we could go we could go on and on with that. And that sort of I don't know what I'm if what I'm saying is that that's kind of a replacement to like just going all in on time travel, which would make sense in a in a sci-fi space fantasy space opera kind of situation. Um but it's curious and I'm glad you brought it up that that Star Wars has largely eschewed the idea that we would need to have uh, time travel as a central a central storytelling device 
Cause I, I think it worked well in, I mean, I think, I think it can work well in certain situations. Not all, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Back to the Future is still the best time travel media ever. Right. I, I think I see what you're saying is that both time travel and resurrection as, as sort of, uh, uh, storytelling ideas th- run the threat of negating the stakes. Mm-hmm. Where where if yes. characters who die can just come back, or if you have the ability to time travel, why don't you just go to the moment before the problem happened and fix it? Yes. Um, so that's exactly you 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 nailed it. You you got where I didn't quite get. That's that's exactly absolutely right. Is that it it it, it nothing matters. You know, uh <laughs> that's why it was so frustrating for fans of my generation to deal with Rise of Skywalker because Vader's redemption arc at the end of Jedi is so final. He he fires the emperor down a reactor shaft in the process of coming back to his own humanity and his relationship with his son. It's brilliant. And so no wonder a bunch of us were really pissed off when we heard <laughs> Ian McDermott's cackle. <laughs> uh, the the reveal that the, that that's that you know Luke says no nothing ever really dies nobody ever really dies, and sure enough you know this is where we're at. Even with C three PO, you know he he had the potential of having a very heroic final moment in the Rise of Skywalker, where he effectively commits a form of suicide so that they can get the information they need to find yep. the Sith homeworld, and what what. What could have played out as a very sad and noble final moment for the character gets negated a few scenes later when R two D two just happens to have a backup to like right before the moment the movie starts. Sure, and C three PO is just back, and it just it what he did doesn't really have the same stakes. JJ, you had mentioned very briefly uh, Avengers Endgame, and I think that was a movie where the filmmakers go into it realizing you know we're using time travel which has these sort of stakes negating qualities to it. And so how do we address that in the movie sort of directly, which I think is essentially what the conversation about time travel between the Hulk and um, War Machine and Ant-Man is about when they're talking about, you know, are we using Terminator time travel logic? Are we using Mm -hmm. Back to the Future time travel logic? You know, are we just negating? Why don't we just go back and kill baby Thanos, you know, and, having to explain to the audience, no, time travel does not work that way, at least not in this series. Yeah, to, to me, the inclusion of time travel in, uh, in just about anything, uh, I agree with everything that you guys are saying, um, with the exception of I also would add this to the list, Greg. I think and it's perfectly uh, set for this. I think the other movie that really nails time travel, even though it's only 13 seconds, um, is uh is of course the Star Trek movie that no one wants to talk about, which is Galaxy Quest. <laughs> oh. um, and in fact, yeah. when you ask J.J. Abrams what his favorite Star Trek movie is, he says Galaxy Quest. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Omega device. Now, I will give them credit when they wrote that uh, that they didn't know if it was time travel or if it was uh, like a matter collapser. So when Tim Allen activates that. He could be destroying the entire universe as well, but luckily it well, takes him back 13 seconds. Well, and also, JJ, the, the, still on the topic of time travel, though, I mean, you and I's favorite Star Trek movie, the whole basis is that they use time travel. Right. But, yep. they, but they, you know, and they, they do it. They, they, It's a very difficult maneuver to pull off, and they have to be very careful that they don't change anything when they go back to get uh, humpback whales to, to speak with the alien menace. But then they give up on that the immediately in the voyage home. Like they <laughs> yeah. change everything. They come out. They give the guy the 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 clear aluminum, and they, they <laughs> you know, DeForest Kelly is they're treating patients left and right. Uh, you know, right. But I, if we're using Avengers Endgame logic, all they did was they created an alternate future somewhere else, a different timeline. Although right. they did not remove an Infinity Stone, so that that may not have actually happened. But they, I, did, I, but they I did like, take they did take someone out of that time. That's true. And then move her to another time, which to me is th- that's the most damning of all. You, We found that out in Back to the Future, too. You don't move one Jennifer from one <laughs> era to another. Come on. <laughs> um, OK, so let's talk about be- beyond the, the films. OK, so th- let's talk about the fact that both of these movies are juggernauts when it comes to merchandising. Um, And 
I also have either of you listened to the podcast Blockbuster by any chance? No. I've so not. I'm going to tell you, listener, after this, uh, I know you're fully caught up on JJ Meets World. Listen to Blockbuster. What it is is the story of how Steven Spielberg and George Lucas started their careers. And it's done with um, a narrator. And then they recreate these important moments. And they have uh, voice actors come in and they play George Lucas and they play Spielberg. And there's someone who plays Marty Scorsese. It's, it is it is awesome like they talk about this moment where george lucas you know they had decided to move the date of star wars opening and nobody thought this movie was going to do any good in fact there's a a, a faithful or a, a fateful night where he screened it for like marty scorsese and steven spielberg and brian yeah. de palma de pa- yep. and they all hated it <laughs> <laughs> and they all gave him these notes, except for Spielberg, who's like, I think this is going to be exciting. This is going to be fun. And after that, he fell into such a huge depression that when he saw people lining up to see it uh, in Hollywood, he uh, he was amazed. Um, but Blockbuster. Awesome. Wonderful. They, they it's it's the biggest wet kiss to John Williams you're ever going to see, because John Williams <laughs> effectively saved Star Wars and Jaws. Um, so going into like the, the other pieces of this, I don't, I don't know because I wasn't a part of this culture enough growing up, but were were conventions like Comic-Con and things like that in a, a part of society before Star Wars, meaning was there a Star Trek convention before Star Wars or were those babies of the eighties? when like-minded people wanted to get together and really, you know, hash out some of these things and meet the cast. Um, do either of you know anything about uh, the, the convention history? Well, the, they definitely existed before star Wars because one of the famous stories of, um, the internal early version of Lucasfilm, um, you know, as it was kind of being developed by, um, Charles Lippincott and Bunny Elsop and the people who are working closely behind the scenes with George to sort of get the word out, they targeted and strategized the idea of um, printing posters and getting them out at conventions, you know, getting getting them in front of fans and trying to build buzz and build word of mouth among the nerd culture, among the geek culture. Um, and that so the, the, there are some great you know stories about that in um, Rinsler's making of Star Wars book and some other some other resources, but I don't know when the kind of you know San Diego Comic Con originated. Um, that's not that's not my in my wheelhouse. There were regular sci-fi conventions that weren't necessarily. My understanding is that they weren't necessarily ever focused on particular franchises for the most part or particular uh, media. So it wouldn't just be books or it wouldn't just be movies. Um, you know, at, at 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 that point, and I think I think I could be wrong, but I believe they have roots in even the '60s and '70s, where it, like it kind of slowly started the culture around having conventions because people who were like minded, who who liked these things, didn't have things like the internet where you could meet other fans and talk about the things that you loved. Oftentimes, you you know, being a a nerd into nerdy culture, you were kind of isolated in a lot of ways. And having those conventions would be a way to to meet meet other people in the space. Um, Anyone who grew up in the Fargo-Moorhead area in the 80s or 90s probably rented videos from Videoland at one point. And Rudy Sigmund, who was the owner and proprietor, um, it, it, when you would walk in, he had all of these signatures from celebrities, uh, up on the walls with their photos. And one of the ones he had was Mark Hamill, a uh, very young looking Mark Hamill. And the story behind that was, was that he actually met Mark Hamill at a, some kind of sci-fi convention before star Wars had even hit. And so he was basically going around, like Greg was saying to conventions, talking up the movie. And so Rudy actually met Luke Skywalker before he was Luke Skywalker in in the public eye and got an autograph with him there. So, yeah, the, they uh, those conventions, I think conventions and then uh, zines, magazines were also sort of a, a big area where the fandom could kind of get together and meet and discuss meet and discuss these topics on the topic of uh, 
merchandising and franchise uh, the the franchises. Um, Yes, Star Trek has a ton of merch out there, but I I just don't think that they can even hold a candle to what Star Wars was able to accomplish, especially with the action figure line. You know, Greg, you were of the age, you were five when Star Wars first came out. So you were the target demographic yeah. for the action figures and the toys. And my understanding was, was that through the action figures, through the toys, that was one way that Star Wars actually did a lot of their world building was that they didn't really have names for the creatures when they were making the movie. Right. But then they needed things to make action figures of, and they had all these crazy monsters and aliens. So um, in much the same way, like uh, trading cards built up superhero worlds for me before I could ever afford the comic books, I have to assume you getting the action figures really was what helped stimulate your imagination in the Star Wars world. Yeah, you can certainly look at YouTube today and see these great... um compilations of all the Kenner uh, toy commercials that are very suggestive about how you are basically beyond the movie, right? Um, The Marvel Comics uh, issues one through six retold the story of the film, but starting with issue number seven, you went beyond the movie, right? It was beyond the movie, beyond the galaxy. You know, you were into new uncharted territory with new characters, and so, yeah, I, for me, and I, and I think you're absolutely right that part of the phenomenon, not only was it just the zeitgeist, it was the perfect timing of everything. Um, and, 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 and I should say the imperfect timing of everything because the, you know, famously Kenner did not have action figures ready to go on May 25th, 1977, you know, you got the early bird kit instead and waited, you know, they weren't, you weren't going to get those action figures until they were, they were available a little bit later, but my grandpa took me to uh, Ben Franklin in the Holiday Mall in Moorhead when there were just 12 choices of Star Wars action figure. And it was on my birthday. And he said, you know, you can pick any one you want. And I chose the Stormtrooper um, as my first Star Wars action figure. And we went then from Ben Franklin to the family birthday party, which was at the Wendy's on 8th Street in Moorhead, which is <laughs> where Taco Bell is now. And um, the other gifts at my party, I received a Darth Vader and another Stormtrooper. And my mom, I've recounted this story to other people before, and I'm sure it's one that resonates with thousands of kids uh, in my generation. My mom said, oh, you already have this action figure. We can return it and get a different one. But I insisted that Darth Vader <laughs> needed to have you know, more than one stormtrooper in his detail. And so I was so thrilled that my first three action figures were the two stormtroopers and, and Vader. But just to finish my thought on this, there's a, there's a pretty um, entertaining documentary called Plastic Galaxy, which is a feature length um, indie uh, documentary about the, the Kenner and Star Wars uh, story. And it's inconceivable now that you know disney wouldn't have a complete and thorough backstory approved by leland chi uh with care with character names and all that even for the most you know fleetingly glimpsed background figures in the movies but in you know with when the original star wars came out kenner was sort of given free reign to just name these these uh you know these secondary characters like walrus man um, would be a classic example of that. <laughs> Snaggletooth is another example of that. And, and you know, now we know that in the, in the canon, you know, Walrus Man is Ponda Baba. But for me, he'll always be Walrus Man because that's <laughs> what he was in his first incarnation on the, on the card back when the, when the second set of Star Wars action figures came out, bringing the total up to, you know, 21. You had, you, it was. you had mentioned some kind of a kit, like a starter kit. What was yeah, that? Yeah, the early bird, the early bird kit. You know, there's lots of websites that'll detail the entire history of this, but because the action figures weren't ready, you would go to Target or you'd go to Ben Franklin or Elko um, or Kmart, and you would buy this uh, basically like a, an empty box. You know, you'd buy a cardboard. It had the um, an image of the the twelve action figures. That were or the characters that were going to be made into the first 12 action figures. And you mailed in your certificate. And then um, some months later, weeks to months later, you would get in the mail um, a little tray that had Chewbacca, um, Princess Leia, R2D2, and Luke Skywalker. 
And so we ordered the early bird kit and it didn't come in the window of time that it was expected to be shipped. So my mom wrote to Kenner and they sent us a replacement one, uh, early bird kit, uh, the, the figures. And then in the meantime, we did get that. So we had my mom in her house somewhere still has an unopened um, set of the of those four action figures from the oh, original. Oh wow, that is that <laughs> is, is a, a that's a collector's good, yeah. item. My goodness. But yes, I so so the bottom line is I am I could we could do a whole other podcast just on how I have like so many thousands and, and maybe millions of, of, of people have helped make, helped make George Lucas a very wealthy man, which is the <laughs> line I often use to joke because from the time I was five until literally today, you know, with virtually no break in between, even during the most fallow period of Star Wars fandom, which was between 1985 and 1995, that's when it was a great time to be a Star Wars fan because you really had to dig. You really had to find your brothers and sisters um, in Star Wars when once they once power of the force, the power of the force action figures ended in 85. Uh, nothing was fresh in this, you know, in terms of uh, action figure collectibles until they announced the the special editions and they started uh, preparing and they had those terrible, like jacked up, bulked up, uh, ripped, muscled uh, figure figure line from 95. That was pretty terrible, but I bought them anyway. Um, and so I, yes, I have like a set of certain Star Wars items from 1977 through 1980, you know, the, the Star Wars that kind of existed before it exploded into the sequel, you know, expanded that universe, um, not setting aside the, the holiday special, which I love and watch, still watch all the time. Um, and JJ's right. It's, it's just terrible, but my kids liked it. Uh, when they were little, so we watched it so often, um, as I've because I've had it on you know various bootlegs of VHSs uh, that I've picked up at conventions or and then later DVD and so on. I have a you know the high, a pretty the best file that I know of now that has the kind of highest quality rendering of it. So I'm kind of a nerd that way. Are but you sort I of have, surprised that they haven't put that like out somewhere? I, at this point, it's become <laughs> such a, a piece of cultural. Uh, mystery that I am just shocked that they don't say like, you know, like especially during this time, like if ABC had been like, guess what? The Star Wars holiday special. Happy life day, everyone. Hope you like your quarantine. <laughs> I am surprised right. that they haven't aired that from, you know, from an actual tape stock that they've got somewhere. Right. Yeah. Well, didn't it's... didn't George Lucas have some sort of famous quote? Maybe it's apocryphal, but that if he had a hammer and a million hours, he would try to destroy every copy of the holiday special he could find. Yeah. He wasn't, he, he wasn't fond of it, of course. Um, in part, you know, he, it was such a, again, it was such a, um, a rapidly expanding juggernaut that he was like signing, you know, signing off on this stuff in part because you're trying to figure out how do I get the money to do the next project and what are, you know, what is, and I'm sure you're thinking, you know, how bad can this be? But uh, it's, you know, obviously it, it speaks for itself in terms of just how cruddy um, the writing for that piece is. Um, and, I, and it had people, you know, like Bruce Valanche working on it, um, you know, Pat Proft. And, and it's just and yet it's still I don't know, it's, it's a, it, it holds a fascinating place in my heart because clearly fa other fans of my generation like John Favreau and Dave Filoni, you know, have embraced the first appearance of Boba Fett by having the sort of what what's lovingly referred to as the tuning fork, right? Be, be a mm -hmm. major weapon in the Mandalorian. I believe there's even a reference to life day. Yeah. Yes. There that's is, right. Yeah. Uh, Horatio, Horatio Sands in, in, episode, in the first episode, Horatio Sands, uh, his, his character is picked up by the Mandalorian as a bounty. And he says, he's, he makes a reference to, to wanting to get home for life day or deal with life day. <laughs> Awesome. So does that does that effectively make the holiday special canon? Yes, I would say so. I hope so. Oh, let's hope that we get a return of Lumpy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that I, I will say, too, about both of these franchises in a similarity is that. A career killer isn't the right word here, but both of these casts had actors who became some of the most you know, bankable faces that you've ever seen. 
as long as they maintain that character. So, you know, you think of poor Mark Hamill and he, you know, he's cast as Luke Skywalker as a young person and he's been Luke Skywalker ever since he's had great like roles outside of Star Wars, but he'll always be Luke Skywalker to everybody. And, uh, you know, William Shatner, same thing. Uh, Leonard Nimoy, it becomes something where these roles are so iconic that you are stuck in them. And I think that that is one of the reasons why when they do new iterations of um, Star Wars or Star Trek, there's this slight worry that, like, I hope I'm a brand already going into it. Um, and I'm going to do as many other movies at the same time as Star Wars or Star Trek is coming out so that I can differentiate myself. And I'm not just Captain Kirk. I'm Captain Kirk, but I'm also the lovable guy in this rom-com with Reese Witherspoon. That was one of the risks with the Kelvin timeline, too, was you know, the fan base was going, how can you have a Captain Kirk that isn't played by William Shatner? How can you have a Spock not played by Leonard Nimoy? And uh they succeeded at it, but I wonder if they would ever, if if that could ever successfully be done on a Star Wars level. You know, would they ever, I mean, conceivably they could at some point, because if it makes money, they're going to do it. But if at, if they ever decided to do a, a time travel, uh, Kelvin Branch timeline for Star Wars, where we're with Luke and Han and Leia again, but they're played by completely different actors... I don't know if that's if that's something that the fan base would ever accept, Greg. What do you think about that? I think I think the characters become so iconic that they ultimately, in the long run, um, and I'm and I mean the the very very long game, they have to transcend the performers that brought them to life. I mean, I, in other words, I believe that somewhere down the road there will be more Luke Skywalker media. Um, right. You know that and, and, that these and Mark Hamill was in trusted with the character and he you know he originated the character and he kind of owns the character and the character owns him like jj said but it seems like you know there's there it just seems impossible to me that there won't be another luke skywalker someday yeah but i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna argue right after that we've seen this and it didn't work we saw solo and right it did not work sure that's true um but that being said, you know, you also get Star Wars seems to be really happy to do, you know, a deep fake CGI of characters um, from people who've passed away that can come back and relive uh, part of it. Or you need to make a Princess Leia that's circa, you know, 1970s. OK, well, we'll just CGI it and give her the weirdest eyeballs. Um, and so to me, that's what Star Wars is doing is they've got these little tiny moments where they want to bring a character back, but they don't really want to recast it. So they'll find a workaround for it. And in the only time, like I mentioned in solo, where we've seen an entire movie that's been redone. Now here's where it works. That new guy who played Chewbacca in solo, I thought was awesome because they showed a slimmer Chewbacca and he is young enough that he was able to do more of the physical things that needed to be done. Um, so I enjoy I enjoyed that. I like that. Now, that's a giant fursuit that someone is putting on and then emoting through and in bringing a performance to life. Um, I I just you know, I, I, I don't I don't see how that's going to go forward. You know, I, I don't see a future where we have Luke Skywalker played by somebody else. But that being said, it's hard to turn down a billion dollars. Right. Well, and and had you know Solo been a success at the box office, uh, the precedent would be set to accept more of this kind of thing. Um, you know, we'll see the popular character Ahsoka Tano uh, portrayed by Rosario Dawson in season two of The Mandalorian, and I'm excited about that. Um, even though I'm far removed from any deep and abiding interest in the prequel realm i did watch season seven of the clone wars because i have children who are in an you know at an age where it's exciting for them and they're really into it and i liked ahsoka tano i mean a lot of people would argue you know star wars fans would argue that she's one of the most if not the most compelling character in the expanded universe you know since the original movie and that may be that may be true. I mean, we haven't talked, we haven't touched on yet today, and we probably should. 
one thing I'm interested in discussing, which is the fandoms of these two franchises and how right. current Star Wars fandom is so, you know, to use the cliche, so toxic that I'm embarrassed to be um, some some days to be a fan of that of that group. Um, or to be a fan of that franchise associated with that group that I don't consider myself part of. Whereas Star Trek fandom seems to be, you know, they were, uh, JJ referred to this earlier today, that at first they were the outsiders, the outliers, they were the geeks and the nerds, but then it, they, then it became kind of hip to be, you know, to be a, a Trek fan at a certain point. Um, and, and so I think the, I would, I would rather, even though I'm, you know, I'm, I guess I'm getting, maybe, maybe we're at the point in the show, JJ, where it's okay to spill the beans. Although I think people can figure it out, right? Yeah, I think it's that, probably time that we show, you know, show our our hand, <laughs> and everyone know where yeah. we sit. Yeah, because I was going to say that, you know, I feel like Star Trek fans are more are co- are more. Um, they're 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 kind of morally superior <laughs> to star <laughs> to star wars fans you know they're they're more intellectual they're 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 better you know they're more they're more logical to associate them with mr spock um and i think so many star wars fans are whiny babies who cry you know who can't handle the idea that there's you know a a uh, something outside of the most narrow um, margins of what they would come to expect as their quote, you know, their Star Wars. If you have a black character, a female character, a non, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant character, you are somehow violating this this trust. It makes them seem like neo-Nazi right-wing fools to me. That might just be, you know. I mean, obviously, we are talking about the loudest people within the space. True, um, true. You know, we are talking about those who decide it's worth their time and energy to go be toxic people on the internet. Right. And and Star Wars has definitely had its fair share of that in, in recent memory. Star Trek is not immune to that by any stretch of the imagination, although I haven't watched Star Trek Discovery, but that that has drawn on a lot of the same kind of fanboyishness um uh sort of crappy attitudes you know whether or not you like a movie or not is is one thing entirely but then to have the motives to go online and go after people and their their uh their beliefs or their desires to be more representative in the media star trek in its dna has always valued that kind of inclusion even though uh because it's still a product of its time so it was always a slow start but you know, Star Trek was where we got the first black captain and the first female captain. And in Star Trek: The Next Generation was the one of the first time in sci-fi that I've ever seen that dealt with gender issues and transgender issues, um, that dealt with racism, that dealt with sexism, that dealt with um, all sorts of other things. And Star Trek, as a as a home, uh, as a franchise home really always felt like it was just a giant dinner table that everyone could sit at and that being a fan of star trek at least in the days before it was cool um was sort of in the same line of being a comic book fan which is you were effectively an outcast in some circles because what you were into was seen as being fringe Whereas Star Wars, the moment it hit the scene, was embraced by the popular culture. You know, everyone liked Star Wars almost immediately. Yeah. And and uh, so everyone kind of felt like they had their own ownership of it versus sort of the slow drip of Star Trek. So I I, I hear what you're saying, Greg, in that the, the battle lines have been really toxic in Star Wars for a while. Um, but... I, you know, I, I do try to see it in terms of those are the loudest, noisiest people. In reality, most people who are a fan of one of those things are a fan of the other thing, and they just like it because they like it. You know, I'm definitely more of a Trekkie than I am a Star Wars guy. I like living in the Star Trek world more, but I still love Star Wars. I, I, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still a part of that team as well, and. I, I kind of think that the more media we get and the more newcomers to the fan base join in, hopefully the less of that toxicity will will bubble up to the top. 
Yeah, I think, you know, certainly Disney has a kind of acute awareness. Um, did either of you watch the first episode of the the um, behind the scenes roundtable for The Mandalorian? Sure did. On, the director's yeah. roundtable? Yeah, it was just added to Disney Plus uh, within the last week or two. And that, you know, is it's it's, you know, they're they're fans who will bristle against it because they'll feel it's so engineered, right? That this, you know, progressive um, idea is being forced down their throat when you see at the round table uh, who, who those directors are, even though, of course, you know, Favreau and Filoni, uh, you know, present externally as these, you know, two middle-aged white guys. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a start, you know, I think, to um, bring characters like Ray into the center of the Star Wars universe that uh that to me was exciting you know and to see you know like Tucker said the the loudest voices in the backlash drive people off of their Instagram accounts uh because they are being you know physically threatened or whatever is pretty disappointing I just I've always wondered this and this is going to sound silly but in Star Wars would the would history keep repeating itself until it got itself right? Is that what we're kind of to learn from this? Is that these things happen over and over and over again? And then bringing that into the the bigger spectrum, I think that Star Wars best moments of recent have been when history does not repeat itself, when you do not have the same creative team yeah. who's tackling it. But in fact, you're getting a fan base who's tackling it. Like li listening to Dave Filoni talk about Star Wars gets me excited about Star Wars. Sure. Well, for, I mean, the rep, you know, the the stories represent, you know, a vast galaxy, right? M you know, multiple alien species, multiple viewpoints. And to say that that then um, that the the artists that enact that the, these multiple diverse viewpoints should not be multiple and diverse is is just, I think, hilarious. It's it's hilarious to me um, yeah. that the members of the fan base feel like something is being crammed down their throat versus they're just looking to, to have a problem with something. Um, you know, it's kind of like a no win situation for 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 the loudest people in the room. Like you're never going to be able to make them happy. So stop trying to make them happy. Just make the thing that you want to make. And when they embrace like they have with the Mandalorian, what each director brings to it, what their Star Wars is like, what they want to see when they're making it, I think just makes for a better product in the end anyways. Yeah. I find that um, when I want to go out in public and do something, I am a Star Wars fan. So there is, <laughs> there is nothing more exciting to me than the moment before a brand new Star Wars movie lights up the silver screen and the usher has to say, all right, everyone, if you could please turn on your lightsabers, we're going to get this thing started <laughs> that there is an energy there that is insane. But when I am in my home, I tend to put in a Star Trek DVD before I put in a Star Wars DVD. And I think it's because as much as I like Star Wars, <clears throat> it is the rewatch quality on them is not there for me as much as it is for Star Trek. Mm. Um, I enjoy sitting down and watching the entire original uh, Star Wars series. So if I've got a whole Sunday, I'll want to go from one or I'll, I'll go from A New Hope all the way to Return of the Jedi in, in one long sitting. But if you said, JJ, what are you going to do later today? I'm, uh, I'd say like, well, you know, if I'm flipping through the channels and Undiscovered Country's on, as long as it's past the uh, first 20 minutes of it, I think I'll watch. And then when Kim Cattrall comes on screen, I'll go and get some popcorn. Um, <laughs> everyone just kind of has their own feeling with that. And so I know it's a cop out to say I'm a fan of both. But I mean, if you ask which one I've spent more money on, 100 percent at Star Wars. I have definitely invested more of my livelihood into Star Wars than I have into Star Trek. But I also feel like I've got this weird secondary like knowledge. Um of star trek so that i can hold a conversation and i get a little excited when i read star trek news and um i like you know i i love how star trek more I, star trek pops up in other things i think way more than star wars does 
Um, I just happened to be watching um, a movie last night called National Lampoon's Senior Trip, <laughs> which is uh, the first role for our, our, our good friend Hawkeye um, is in it as a high school senior. But there's a whole side story of Kevin McDonald being a crossing guard who's obsessed with Star Wars, and he is tracking him the whole time, and he's got a phaser and a communicator, and I am loving every minute of this weird Star Trek parody that is within a silly throwaway early 90s comedy. Um, and I think that you see that pop up just a lot more, maybe because it's easier to make fun of. It's easier to make fun of Star Trek and the the threshold for the costuming and some of the props to make fun of it is lower than doing something for Star Wars. But, you know, also Star Trek never got a full on Mel Brooks treatment the way that Star Wars did. And there is something to be said about that as well. <laughs> That's true. One of my favorite uh, mistakes that often gets made by who I would call the uninitiated. So those who are who are neither really Star Trek or Star Wars fans, but have had to deal with those of us who are. <laughs> and so they want to try to communicate with us is when people uh, mix up. May the force be with you with live long and prosper. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's one of my my favorite things. You'll see someone try to like do the Vulcan hand signal <laughs> and then say, you know, may the force be with you. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know where else I wanted to insert that in this episode, but that's no, that's, that's one good. of my it's favorite like, uh, mistakes. It's like Lucille Bluth, you know, handing the cash to Anyang <laughs> saying, go see a Star War, yeah. um, <laughs> which has obviously been memed, you know, to death and still shared as as a gif um, or the or the or the other another meme, you know, the one that um, I think Brent Brandt has shared it often, the mashup of all, you know, if you want to irritate someone, um, <laughs> it has the picture of Spock and. It, it sort of like mashes up Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and gets everything wrong um, in one simple image for, you know, again, for people who don't care about any of this stuff. I, but, I, I, I believe there's one of Patrick Stewart where it's him and the quote is, may the force be with you. And it's attributed to Harry Potter. Yeah, th that <laughs> yep, that sort of thing. Exactly. So let me ask you this as we wrap up this episode, this uh, Star Trek Star Wars episode. Do you think that there is room in the sci-fi genre for another franchise, a third franchise to get in and have the kind of staying power? We've seen things like Battlestar Galactica had a, a great resurgence and was very, very popular amongst Battlestar Galactica fans. I um, would I would love for a series called Star Love and it's all romance and it's just romance, but in outer space. Oh, mm -hmm. um, I believe that I, there's I, an, an adult series from Showtime that could scratch that itch for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think anything's possible. I mean, that's, you know, um, in, in the in the timeline of motion picture history, Star Trek and Star Wars are still, you know, relatively speaking, you know, not they're 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 young ish. Right. I mean, it's um, I'm. I was uh, five years old in 77 when Star Wars came out. And so I didn't know anything, you know, I didn't know any better. And so um, who knows what, you know, what amazing storyteller who hasn't maybe been born yet could bring to, you know, to the, to the table. I mean, we saw a phenomenon and, you know, what's what we've talked about this before on previous episodes, but, you know, franchises that have um, a similar kind of, incendiary quality you know a similar burn to star wars like harry potter is maybe you know the newest one the newest kid on the block in that regard where you're talking uh theme parks right i mean that that's a that's a at a different level um and star star wars is you know has an edge over star trek in that arena uh where whereas earlier in the show we've talked about how star trek has you know more hours of total content than Star Wars. Do you so I Tucker, have you ever gone to the thing in Las Vegas, like the Star Trek experience? I can't remember which hotel has it. Maybe the Luxor. Uh, I, I have not. And in fact, that's reminding me of uh what was once a plan for a casino hotel in Vegas that never actually got off the ground. But man, I wish it had happened for the longest time. They were actually planning on building a casino hotel 
that was uh, to scale the shape of the Enterprise mm-hmm. for a number, <laughs> from Star Trek The Next Generation and that you would have been able to visit different rooms and then, you know, stay in a room that was Star Trek themed and, you know, go to 10 Forward for drinks and then, you know, obviously they can't do holodecks, but that they, they were doing, they, you know, just imagine the Vegas skyline and then seeing the Enterprise sort of parked inside of there. That would have been killer. Um, I have not seen the the Star Trek experience, though. I do want to check that out. That's one of the things where, you know, it's been there for so long. You kind of wonder, you know, if it's time to put that uh, that horse out to pasture. Um, and of course, Star Wars, you know, Greg, you, you hit the nail on the head with the theme park. You know, Disney has invested a lot of money in this theme park experience. Um and from what I understand is if you are a casual fan of Star Wars, it's just fine. Just like how you are enjoying the Cars world uh, if you're in Disneyland. Right, just, yeah. Yep. Um, and then the deep fans really, you know, getting your picture and getting to be that close to the Millennium Falcon is amazing. If is. you are someone who's just OK with it, um, you might as well just, you know, head over to the Magic Kingdom instead. Um, because it asks a lot of you, you know, the Star Wars land asks a lot of you as a fan to come in and to understand uh the mythos and to understand who characters are and what you you know you're allowed to say and not to say and it's kind of like next level cosplay only they won't let you dress up like a jedi and go no, in there. only if you're a little kid yeah. right so to me I, I i find i find that like to me maybe the one of the bigger missteps with star wars was this star wars land and I watched the Imagineering story on Disney Plus, which is awesome. If you haven't watched that yet, it is phenomenal. Um, and when they talk about uh, Batu, I I kind of get this. I, I watch it and I go, OK, well, but that doesn't really feel like what I want. And maybe this hotel that they're building where you essentially, are, you know, I don't know why they're building it attached to Disneyland. You should have just built this hotel somewhere else because your three days at this hotel are all about a one giant immersive story. And that to me sounds really awesome. I can't imagine spending upwards of $2,000 for three nights stay, a three nights stay for myself. I don't know how families can afford to do some of this thing. Um, it reminds yeah, me of another- that scene in Jurassic park where they're saying, uh, maybe we'll have a, a coupon day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another podcast conversation is about, you know, um, w- how unaffordable some of this stuff is for uh, people in in you know even the middle class, uh, and that that's that is too bad. I mean, we our family uh, saved up to to go to Disney World in October, and we we loved Galaxy's Edge. We all had a blast, but obviously we we were a we were a target demographic, a, a built in built-in fans and and Forrest and Violet both got to build um droids at the droid factory nice. which was you know an absolute highlight we still play with them pretty much every day you know and i my my biggest regret of the trip is that i didn't also build a droid i find myself <laughs> thinking back regularly like why didn't i also you know spend the there's like a 100 dollars you know to build to build a droid but it's pretty it's it's a uh, it's a I think, you know, a hundred dollars is, is, uh, you know, this is like, for, you know, for first world issues here, right. To talk, to be able to talk about spending a hundred dollars on a remote control piece of plastic. Uh, but it's, um, as, you know, as the experience goes, it was one of the most memorable, um, of our, of our trip. And so there's things, I know that's getting, you know, far, a little far afield from what we were talking about related to, you know, Trek versus wars in terms of the kind of, uh, you know, world building beyond the, the, the TV and film media. Uh, but I, I think, um, I think that when, you know, after the pandemic changes the way that people go to Disney world and theme parks, I think it'll still thrive. I think uh, that, Greg, uh, you go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I think, you know, you're, you're, you hit on something really important there, Greg, which is, um, I was slated to go to, um, Disneyland just as the uh as the pandemic hit and I had already mm-hmm. made my appointment to build a lightsaber. Um yeah. my lovely wife gave me a Christmas gift which was a Disney gift card that I could use because it's expensive. But that yeah. that that ability to have that experience. My sister went to 
the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and was chosen for a wand ceremony. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, we, we did it, that. We, yeah. Well, it made her cry. Like she was, yeah. uh, she was, uh, you know, a 28 year old who openly wept yeah. because <laughs> she's getting to perform magic. Sure. And to me, those experiences are where it's at. You will never be able to do that with like build your own vocoder. I just don't <laughs> think that people would be as excited about that. Yeah. Greg, you've got a perspective that Jage and I don't have yet in that since you have children and, you know, you both as a child discovered Star Wars and the action figures and the world. And now you've got two kids that you've been able to pass that love on to. What has it been like to watch uh, Forrest and Violet uh, soak in Star Wars and become fans of it? You know, they've got access to your toys, but also the new toys that comes out. What has yeah. that been like? It's really... Um mellowed my harder edges about star wars fandom i'm i remember and you've heard me tell the story that you know i was in hawaii with ted larson and dana harris and chris carley and matt dryling and we went to phantom menace and it was a pretty quiet car ride home um and in my head was bouncing around this idea that oh my gosh i've been living a lie you know my whole life because i was so disappointed um at that time and now I feel, you know, watching Forrest and Violet get so into Star Wars as a comprehensive experience. I mean, I when I I had the um, honor of presenting the um, Elber's Humanities Festival keynote um, when they did the Star Wars themed um, festival a few years ago at Dickinson State University, and I took the kids out there, and the the nature of my my address was on the different ways that one interacts as a Star Wars fan. You know, whether you're a Mike Schultz who is into the chaos of embracing Jar Jar Binks and everything that goes with that, to, you know, a hardline originalist like me who often talks about Star Wars in terms of um, the singular experience of just the first movie where Darth Vader is not Luke's father. Luke and Leia are not siblings, right? All of that stuff has is yet to be. It's hard to imagine that. But I love watching Forrest and Violet get really into um the not just the 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 media itself, because they, you know, they're they're into watching the Clone Wars and the Mandalorian and and you know, soaking up all that stuff. But also um Forrest especially has taken a deep interest in my action figure collection. And so he watches a lot of YouTube channels like Retro Blasting and and other ones that do deep dives on the toys and and uh, that era. And it's it's a lot of fun for me. It's um, it's emotional for me to watch it. I think that's a great way to <clears throat> describe uh, how how enduring these series are for us. And so. I think it's time to put this thing to bed. I know people are probably itching to break out their Return of the Jedi uh, cassette tape because they want to watch it in its original format. Um, and uh, or people want to get out there and throw their red shirt on and just see where the day takes them. Uh, Greg, <laughs> you're safe if you're your next generation. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, always a pleasure to have you on JJ Meets World. And uh, thanks for the great talk today. Thank you so much. It was a ton of fun. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes each week, visit JJMeetsWorld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting MoonBaseMaria.com. If if you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. In Galaxy Quest, I love the fact that they come up with a phrase like the live long and prosper and may the force be with you. And if any of you have forgotten, it goes like this. Never give up. Never surrender. 